All right, part two. In our last video, we made the ground of the scene, and in this one, instead, we're going to focus on creating the rings, the car, and the cube camera that renders the reflections of the car. We'll start by downloading and importing the car model. As always, you can find all the assets necessary to display the model in the repo of the project. I'll share the link in the description of the video. Or you can use Sketchfab, I'll also share this link, and you can directly download the, mod the model from their website. From now on, I'm going to assume that you have downloaded the assets of the model and you've placed them inside this folder, public, models, car. And I have just made a simple car component where I'm importing the GLTF file that we have just downloaded. I'm using use loader from React Tree Fiber and the GLTF loader from Tree.js to download the model. The units of the original model are way too large for our scene, so as soon as we get the model, we have to scale it down significantly to make sure that it can be visible in our scene. We're also pushing the model down by a small amount, and we're using the traverse function on the GLTF model to reference all the children of this object. This particular model is comprised by multiple children. For example, there's one for every, for every tire of the car, there's one for the body of the car, etc. We want to reference all of these meshes with the traverse function and make sure that they can cast and receive some shadows and set the environment map intensity of their material to 20. Finally, since this GLTF object was not created declaratively with Reactory Fiber, we have to inject it in the scene graph with the primitive JSX element. The primitive placeholder is basically used each time you're creating something outside of the Reactory Fiber space and then you want to reference it in the scene graph. Uh, one thing to note is that whenever you're using it, it will not be automatically disposed. So you will be responsible for disposing this object in the future. We're ready to show our new components, so just import it inside app.js and let's see if it works. There you go, there's our car model. And if you look closely, it's also being reflected on the ground, which is pretty cool. All right, moving on to the rings components, which I've just created. We need 14 rings. And by the way, this is the Chad way of building a 14 elements array. Any other way is wrong, just know that. Uh, now that we got that out of the way, this is how you would build a torus geometry. And as a quick reminder, the first argument of the constructor of a torus geometry is the radius of the ring. This is instead the radius of the tubular part of the geometry. And these are just tessellation values decided to that decides how many triangles are we going to use to draw this geometry. We're also setting some defaults, so for example, emissive and color. By the way, if you didn't know, emissive is basically a property that makes this material act as if it was a light source. And in this case, like this will be the color of the light source. The color of the material is set to all zero. We want to make sure that this specific object is not reflecting light from other objects in the scene. This is one way of doing that. We're also setting the position to zero. We're going to change this shortly. We want to make sure that the mesh cast and receives some shadows. And with the use ref, I'm also saving basically a reference to all the elements that we are creating with this array. But we don't want all the rings to be positioned at the center of the scene. So the next step will be to actually use a new hook called use frame to position the rings that we have just created. Use frame is a hook that lets you specify a function that will run every time there's a new frame to render. So it is sort of expected for this function to run 60 frames per second, and we're not doing any animation yet in the scene, so it's kind of useless to use it uh, as it is now because I'm always setting the same position, but it will be useful later when we'll start moving the rings. And the way I'm positioning the rings is pretty straightforward, so I'm getting the mesh from the items ref array, and then I'm setting the z value of um, the position of this mesh. Now, this statement Remember, the range of this statement is between minus 7 and 6 because we have 14 elements in the array. And if I were not to multiply by 3.5 and I was just going to set the z this way, then every ring would be spaced apart by one unit. I don't want that. I want, I want it to be spaced a little bit more, so I'm just multiplying it by 3.5. And basically that's all there is to the placement of, this, of these rings. Let's now save this component and import it inside app.js and let's see if it works. So we do see some rings and they're also nicely reflected on the ground, but the way they are coded right now is not that interesting. So they're always of the same size, they're always of the same color, and they're not fading out the further away they are from the scene. So 
we have to fix that. We're now going to change the scale of these rings and inside the disc variable I'm going to record how far away from the center of the scene this ring is. So as this value gets bigger, this one will get smaller. And by the way, I'm using the same value for all elements of scale. It would also be cool if we could have alternating colors for each ring. So for example, in this case, for every odd ring, we're going to give it a reddish color. And for even rings, we're going to use a bluish one. And this is the result so far, which is way more interesting, but we're still missing a key element. We want these rings to fade out the further away they are from the center of the scene. So let's focus on that. We're going to do that with a new color scale variable that I'm using in place of the R code at 0.5 that we had before. So color scale would be at its maximum value, which is 1, until the distance of this ring from the scene is bigger than 2. So if this ring has a distance that is greater than 2, then we're going to use this statement to modulate the intensity of the color scale. And so basically, this statement will resolve to a number that is between 0 and 1, depending on the value of distance. So if the value of distance is 12, this block will be this entire statement will resolve to one if distance is two instead will resolve to zero but if distance is two we don't want color scale to be zero so basically again if distance is true, this block of code will be zero. And we, we want color scale to be one at that point because we are just starting to fade out the scale of the color of the ring. So in that case, when distance is true, this block will resolve to zero and one minus zero will be one. So color scale will be at its maximum intensity. Instead, if we are at the highest distance that we're allowing with this code block, which is 12, and this one will resolve to one, then it will be one minus one which is zero, so color scale at that point will be zero and the ring has been correctly faded out to zero as it went uh, further away from the center of the scene. And here I'm just halving the scale of the color because otherwise it would have been too intense and I didn't like that. Oof, that was not easy. But the rings that we have now are way more interesting. Look at that, they're properly spaced, they have alternating colors, the size changes depending on their position and we're also fading out the way we want it to but they're still not being reflected onto the car's body. And that makes sense from a rendering perspective because the car only knows about the two spotlights that are shining light on top of it. It doesn't know anything about these rings and the rest of the scene. One way of solving this issue is by creating an environment map at the center of the scene that is basically rendering and saving its surroundings in a texture that, we'll, that we are later going to use to uh, apply reflections onto the car. This environment map would render all the elements of the scene besides the car itself, which is the object onto which we want to place these reflections. And I've replaced the car components with this code block. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm creating a cube camera, as I mentioned, which by default is placed at the center of the scene. And I'm setting the frames property to infinity, which basically means that this cube camera will keep on being updated on every frame. You can pass a function to this uh, JSX component and the function returns a texture, which is basically what the cube camera rendered on that frame. And we want to use this texture as our environment map. Uh, the, environment ma the environment component is going to be used as a default environment map for all the materials in our scene, uh, including our car. Now, specifying car inside the cube camera means that we are going to exclude this element from the cube camera render list. So basically, every other element of our scene is going to be rendered inside the cube camera texture, except our car component. You can also add more element in here and each element that you had would be excluded from the cube camera render list and it would not appear inside the texture that is being generated. And if we refresh the page, we can see the magic happening in real time. Look at how cool these reflections look in this model. Uh, but they're not geometrically accurate. So for example, if I place the camera here, you would see a ring, which doesn't really make any sense. But this is an artifact of the way that we are actually generating these reflections because you, you, you have to imagine a camera that sits at the center of the scene that is sort of recording its surroundings. And then we're using that texture to uh, create the reflections of this car. So obviously the, um, the front of the car is not placed at the center of the scene. So it's not going to accurately catch the reflections that uh, would be cast from this direction. But the, um, 
the simplification that we're using actually gives convincing results and so we can use it even for scenes of this kind where we have a bunch of rings that are moving in our direction and the effect will still be convincing even if from a geometrical perspective is not really accurate. All right, I'll stop talking. I think that we've covered so much in this video and I'm really happy with the result that we've got so far. I hope you're finding these videos useful and I'd love to see you on the next one where we're going to place a bunch of boxes in the scene plus some cool post-processing effects. Until then, see you next time. Bye-bye.